Hey, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to show you two methods to make a password protected archive. One is the convenient way and the other is more of like the best practices, more secure way to do it. I'm going to try to keep this video on the short side, so we're going to jump right into this and get going. All right, so the first option is going to be with using 7-Zip and there's a few things to keep in mind if you're going to use 7-Zip. Now I'm just going to give a disclaimer ahead of time. I really like 7-Zip. I think it's an excellent program and it's great for encryption unless you have like some nation state actor that's after you. I really don't see any reason that you can't use this to make password protected archives, but there is a couple of things that we'll cover there. For those that might not be familiar with this, either with 7-Zip or that you can do this with 7-Zip, so let's say you want to add something and make an archive out of it. So in this case, the Firefox setup file here, let's just say. There's just a couple of things that you need to do with this to make this work. First of all, you've got to use a password and it does need to be a good one. If you use a short password, like six or eight characters, some crappy password, it can be easily broken. Now, one thing that's important here is make sure that if you're going to do this, if you want good security with this, you need to make sure you encrypt file names. The reason that you want to do this, if you turn this into a password protected archive, but you don't encrypt file names, let's say you have 30 files in here, you can actually open the archive and see what all of the files are. It just won't let you extract it without the password. If you want to keep people from being able to see what the actual files in the archive are, you have to make sure that you select the encrypt file name option. Now, because I'm sure people, one or two people might bring this up, so I'm just gonna bring this up ahead of time and address this now. So there's this article here from Elcomsoft blog. Now, Elcomsoft is a digital forensics company. They specialize in helping get into things like password protected archives. Like, it's a, it's a data forensics company. This is part of what they do is accessing encrypted data. And I'll link this down below. I'm going to link this and then the other thread that I'm going to pull up here in just a second, because I'm not going to go through the whole thing. You could read this on your own time if you want to, to find out more about what these are talking about. But one thing to keep in mind here is it says, interestingly, 7-Zip does not currently use salt to further strengthen the security of its archives, which seems like a big omission to us. Now, this was talked about on the SourceForge forums here, where this was brought up by one of the commenters saying that they, they brought this up from the Elcomsoft blog and that they had concerns with it. And the developer of 7-Zip, Igor, got on here and he wrote a few different replies in here. I'm not going to read through everything. Like I said, I'll let you come in and read this on your own time. I'll drop a link to it down below. But it does, he did say about salt for key generation, it can only help in 7-zip from dictionary password attacks with short passwords, but short passwords are the problem. They cannot be solved for 100% in any solution. Using longer passwords is basically the solution for that problem. And there was quite a bit of discussion between this guy Peter and Igor, and eventually Peter said, ended up saying, I see we're not getting anywhere on this. Thank you for taking your time to answer our online questions. Now there's people, you can go search like out some Reddit threads and stuff. I'm not, I wasn't gonna drop like 10 different links down below for people to read. You can do some Googling on this if you want to. But there are some other people talking about their concerns with it. And the thing is, like this is a digital forensics company. This is what they specialize in is getting access to encrypted data. Igor is a single developer. And even these guys say that it's by them saying that it's a big omission to us. This to me reads like, hey, it's kind of concerning to us that there's no salt mechanism for 7-Zip. So like I said, I don't think 7-Zip is bad at all. I use it all the time, including to use, cre including to create password protected archives, by the way. So like I said, I don't want people to think that I'm hating on the software. I think it's really good software. Just something to be aware of if that's something that could potentially be an issue for you. And I did some Googling and it doesn't look like a salt function has been built into 7-Zip since this article was published back in 2021. So yeah, act accordingly on that. Now, the other thing that we will cover here, this is like the best practice, like the really good stuff right here. This is probably about the best you can get. Like you can just drop an individual file or folder into this. It's really fast, it works really well, super secure. Now the thing with this is there's other options you can use out there to create password protected archives. 7-Zip is a really good option. This is probably about the best and the fastest. Like you can use things to encrypt created files like Cryptomator or Veracrypt, but this is just lightweight. It's really easy to use. And so I don't see a need to complicate stuff. 
Now, there is something I'm going to point out here real quick. Just a few things I want to point out on this page. So this is the official repo. We'll drop a link to this down in the description as well. A couple of things. The So this has not yet been audited. The code base has not yet been audited. He's opened up donations for it to hopefully get a audit done by cure 53 at some point hopefully it would happen but i do think it's a really good program just because it has not been audited does not mean that i think that it's not worth using i think that this is an excellent program something i do want to point out if you want to download this this is the only place you should download it don't go to so the developer mentions that people a person or people have set up picocrypt.com and picocrypt.org and that you should not be downloading the software from there because he's not affiliated with those domains in any way and if you want to get something that's not already been maliciously tampered with then it needs to come directly from this repository so like i said i will have a link to that down in the description so let me walk you through how to use this we'll cover a couple of things back here in just a second but i'm going to give you a brief description of what this is and how to use these different features in here so what you do is you drag and drop files into PicoCrypt and what you can do, so you could drop like either individual files themselves or you can drop an archive or a folder with different files inside of that folder. So if you have like 10 files or 20 or whatever, then you would just drop the entire folder and it will tell you what it is like oh, okay you're encrypting like two or three folders with 30 different files. Now there's a couple of different ways to do the password function on here. First of all, what you can do is you can click create and it will just give you like you can turn up the settings here, have all of these on here, click generate. Now that gives you a password that you can use. The other thing that you can do is use a key file. This is basically random bits in a file that you can create. So if I were to click on this and save it, what it does is it creates this key file that you can see right here. Now there's a couple of different things you can do. So you can either set this so that you need a password to unlock the archive. You can create a key file, drop that in here, and use that to create your encrypted folder or file. Or what you can do is you can use both a password and a key file, or you can also do multiple key files. So you could do like three different key files and you could drop those in here. And the other thing that you could do is you could also require correct order. So you'd have to drop key file one first, then key file two, then three, which is a really cool way of doing this. So you have a few different options there. And the way to think about this is almost like, for people that aren't familiar with this, it would be almost like two-factor authentication because the password is something that you know and the key file is something that you have. Similar concept there. Comments, so you can type in comments just like the developer has written in here. The comments are not encrypted, so just keep that in mind. Now there's a few different options in here. You can do compress files. Now this just does standard encryption or compression on the files. It's not as good, obviously, as like 7-zip, but it works well enough. It'd just be standard like if you're going to create like a regular zip file, basically. Then you can do delete input files after encryption. So I have Firefox setup selected right now. So if I select this and then create this file, it will create the encrypted archive and it will delete the original file. Recursively, what this is, let's say you have this archive folder here. Inside of there, you have two different folders. Each folder has 10, 10 different files. Now, what this allows you to do, if you select this option, it will individually encrypt those files and you will get individual, so let's say you have 10 different text files. It will give you 10 different encrypted files that you can drag and drop in here one at a time. Basically, the purpose of that is, is for people like if, let's say you wanted to encrypt a thousand files at a time and they're all inside of a folder. What this does is then when you wanna go back to access files, instead of having to decrypt the entire thing, you can just pick out, okay, well, I only need like these two or three files. So they'll all use the same password and or key file, all of those thousand individual files. But recursively just means that, like I said, it splits. If you have 10 different files, it gives you 10 different encrypted outputs. Now, the next thing that's an option on there is paranoid mode. Now, I am not a cryptographer, so I might not be explaining this properly. But basically what this is, so these are your encryption algorithms here. So what happens if you select paranoid mode is it will encrypt the file with this method and then go back and encrypt it again using the serpent method. And then to authenticate, data it uses hmac slash sha3 i guess that's probably how you pronounce that 
This is, I believe it's hash-based message authentication control. So if you've ever been to download, so if you were to download, I think you can do this with something like Cubes OS. Like, you know, that, like if you've ever been to some of these websites to go download something and they're like, oh, make sure you encrypt the hash of this file to make sure it's legitimate. So they'll give you like an MD5 checksum or something like that. What that is, is so that if you download that file, let's say you downloaded Cubes OS, for example, and you wanted to make sure that that had not been tampered with in any way, you would check that hash, it's this long string of letters and numbers, and make sure that it's not different from what the developer said it was, because if it's different, even if you were to change just one byte of data inside of like, let's say a huge file, for example, the hash will change completely. And so let's say you're doing an MD5 checksum, for example, like you're checking to make sure that the file is original, it's what it's supposed to be. That's a way to basically authenticate the archive or the file or whatever to make sure that no one has tampered with it. So this is the same thing. And my understanding with how this works is that it's like using an MD5 checksum, for example, but the HMAC part means that it also uses a secret key when it's creating that hash, which I'll come back to that here in just a second because there's more to that. And then the other thing is argon two parameters are increased significantly as well. Now, what it means by argon two parameters is it uses more CPU threads when it is encrypting the file. It's increasing the time that it takes to compute this stuff. And it also increases the memory use for uh, creating a hash. If I understand the parameters of argon2 properly. So basically what that means is this is supposed to be protection against things like brute force attempts and side channel attacks. So when you put all of it together, it is like extremely secure. Now the next thing is read Solomon. This says it prevents file corruption with erasure coding. If anyone has not ever experienced this before, so I'll use 7-zip as an example. And again, like this is not an attack on 7-zip. It's excellent software. This is just sometimes things go wrong when you're trying to create an archive. I've only had this happen a few times and I've used 7-zip hundreds if not thousands of times to create archives. What can happen is like let's say you go to create something somehow some of the data gets corrupted while the archive is being made or you transfer from one disk to another there's an issue with the drive somehow or whatever the case. What can happen is those archives can get corrupted so sometimes and like I said if you've never experienced this at some point, you probably will, like if you're using 7-zip, is then when you go to extract the archive, because there were some, some of the data got corrupted, is you'll get an error that comes up saying, hey, this file could not be extracted. I don't remember the exact error message because it's been so long since I've had this happen, but it will say something like, this data is corrupt, 7-zip cannot extract this file. Read Solomon is designed to help prevent this. It's not foolproof it adds it says on the page here i think it's eight bits of data per 128 bits it says that means you can have up to three print three percent of your file get corrupt and people crypt will still be able to correct the errors and do decrypt the files with no corruption but it says like if it's really bad like if you drop your hard drive then it's probably not going to be able to fully recover any of the files there so that's just something to keep in mind next thing is deniability what this is is plausible deniability so this basically puts out a bunch of random bits for your data so and then it doesn't have like a standard he file header so let's say you were to make this what it will do let me just go ahead and show this to you here so when you create a cr encrypted file with picocrypt what you get is a file that shows so in this case the exe.pcv presumably that means picocrypt volume what you have to do so if you select the plausible deniability option here what you have to make sure that you do is you later go in and change this to like, let's say JPEG, for example. The point of using this is so that you can hide files, but you now there's a lot to this. There's a lot more than just coming in here, renaming it. You really have to think about like the file size, where you put it on your folder, the extension that you select. There's a lot that goes into this. If you are a person that needs plausible deniability, then your threat model is probably such that you're going to know all of the specifics that you need to keep in mind when you're using something like this. But this is so you can basically hide something and it gives you the ability to deny 
oh, well, that's not actually an encrypted file and no one could actually tell the difference because it just looks like a bunch of random data. And then when you need to encrypt it, you just change the file name back and drop it in here and decrypt the file and away you go. Now, if you do select the plausible deniability option, uh, it will not have, so like if you wanna try to do paranoid mode, it will not work with plausible deniability. That's just something to keep in mind. And then you have the split into chunks option. So this is, let's say you have a 50 gigabyte file and you want to split it down into five, 10 gigabyte chunks. So you could come in here and select that. Overall, this is a really good, really simple option. I mean, like you can see, it's really quick, easy to use. Once you've come in here and played with this a little bit, it's really easy to just basically come in here and fly through this stuff, creating whatever it is that you want to. And then, so like, let's say you wanna share these files with another person. So you could either upload these to like, let's say OneDrive, but you don't want your files to be read by Microsoft. You could do it that way. So that way they're encrypted here. What I would say if you're gonna do that is actually use Cryptomator is the better option for that. Unless you just need like one or two encrypted files. If you're going to send this stuff to other people, they just have to have a copy of PicoCrypt and they're good to go. They can drop the file in here and use the password and or key file that you have. Uh, and just give that to them. Anyway, that's going to wrap the video up. Finally, a little shorter of a video this time. Anyway, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them down below and let me know, and I will see you in the next one.